we had such a great turnout. This is our very first Lessons from Leaders, and uh, it's a, an idea we came up with in our MBA alumni forum. Um, that would be the spam email you get quite frequently from me. Uh, I apologize for that, only a little bit. Um, we're very, very lucky to have uh, newly minted CEO Rick Tickner joining us tonight uh, with uh, our Dean Bill Silver for a little fireside chat without the fire. Um, we can fix it. <laughs> thank you again for coming. Um, we're hoping to make this a uh, recurring uh, event, and we'll have a little more details when we wrap tonight. Uh, but now, I'll hand it over to Dean Silver and uh, Mr. Pignan. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ron. Do you guys need, do you need the mic? Can you guys hear me? I have, I, have a mic on. I have a mic on. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. you have a mic. Is this better? Thanks everyone for, for being here. Rick and I talked a little bit yesterday uh, about the conversation we might have and one of the things we decided is that we wanted to keep it informal and involve everyone in the room a, as much as possible. Uh, Rick kindly offered that if people want to uh, talk about something as it comes up as opposed to us talking for a half hour and, and then asking questions, that, that was fine as well. Yeah, I think it's my preference of that. If you have a question anytime while we're talking, just raise your hand, let's answer it right away. For me, it's more about that dialogue, it's more off the cuff, and it makes me feel more comfortable, versus waiting until the end and then asking questions, so bring it on, I guess. <laughs> Anything you want to talk about? I haven't taught some of these people, you better be careful. <laughs> you say, say, say bring it on, You're, you may actually get it. So let's just start learning a little bit more about your story. So, so share with us, sir, how did it all, all begin? Uh, I'm assuming you weren't born to be CEO of a company, or maybe you were. I, think I was. How, yeah. how did it start for you? No, actually, a good question is that I told some of the people in the room, I'm from Modesto, which is a nice little wine company called Gallo there. Mm -hmm. And so as I grew up in Modesto, my mother worked for the glass plant, actually, as a laborer. She basically wore a you know, plastic hat and went to work. But I worked at a liquor store, which this guy was the national sales manager for Gallo, and, and he owned this liquor store I worked at. So I knew that after I got out of college, I had an opportunity to go to work for Gallo. So after I went to San Diego State, and uh, I, after I graduated from college, actually one of the experiences I had at college was I had two job offers. But I took the Gallo one first. This is interesting because there are MBA students in the room. And I went to one of my sales management classes, and they said, well, who's got a job offer in the room so far? So I had a job offer already from Gallo. And the guy says, well, how's it going? I said, well, I'm still interviewing. And the guy said, well, why would you still interview if you've already made a commitment to this one company? You know, it kind of lacks integrity. You know, why, why would you make a commitment? Because they're making plans around you to, to actually have you come on board. So a very valuable lesson as I got into the business was it was all about integrity and being kind of a man of your word. But when I got to Gallo, I think the thing was, I didn't go to Gallo because I liked wine. And I think sometimes people think you get into the wine industry because you like the product. I didn't get into wine because I liked wine. I thought business was the way to go. I had a marketing degree, so I thought that's kind of where I was headed. And being from Modesto, that was easy. So I worked for Gallo for about four years, and you do a lot of activities at Gallo back in the 80s, back when, you know, kind of jug wines or commodity wines were big back then. And America was just, at that time, really starting to learn how to drink wine. They weren't even drinking really Chardonnay or Cabernet back then. They were drinking kind of what we called, you know, commodity wines or, or generic wines. And then uh, this guy came to me in like 1986 or 7, give or take. I've been there for four years. And when I was a Gallo guy, I thought, I, I own this place. I was making like 37500 bucks. I thought I was the man there, right? So this guy came in, he offered me twice my salary, and I was gone the next day. And the Gallo at the end of the day, they didn't care because they had a machine. I mean, they were a great recruiting machine. They trained you great. And a lot of people, if you look around the industry today, there's a lot of 50-year-old people in the industry that started in the 80s that went to work for Gallo. But then I went to work for Louis Martini Winery when it wasn't owned by Gallo. And what I learned about Louis Martini wine was it was about the quality of the product. It was about the vineyards. It was about the winery. It was about the barrels. And so I learned a lot about wine working for a small winery back then. Louis Martini back in the late 80s was probably less than 100,000 cases. But at one point, they let all of their sales team and marketing team go. So I was like, well, I'm out of work. So I felt that pain. By that time, I think I had a wife and two kids at that point, because I had a Gallo kid, and a Louis Martini kid, and a KJ kid. And so I met this guy, Jess Jackson, in 1991. And Jess, at, during the job interview, Jess never really asked me a question, really. He basically just talked about what his vision was you know, for the wine business. And back in 1991, Kendall Jackson as an item or a, or a brand was probably the hottest thing going back in the early 90s. You know, fighting varietals, and people were just starting to drink Chardonnay. 
And Jess was talking about artisan brands, talking about the estate program that he was creating. And I was like, he was talking about Russian River Pinot Noir. I was like, no one knows what the hell Russian River Pinot Noir is in 1991. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the organization then, really as a you know, West Coast kind of division of vice president of sales. But then every year, you know, Jess kind of came back to me and I was a you know, division manager and then I ran, you know, we actually started our own distributor in 1996 in California called Regal Wine Company. So what, what some people don't always know is that we have a three-tier system in our business, right? We sell to distributors, distributors to Safeways and Luckies and stores, and then they sell to you. Is that We wanted to be a part of that system, so we started our own distributor in 1996, and I headed that up. So I was probably, I had a lot of experience with my Gala background, and so we, had, we started off with like 10 people, and today we have 280 people just in that one part of our business. And then really in 2001, I became a senior vice president, and then 2010, uh, Jess came to, actually I went to Jess one day, kind of an interesting story. I told Jess, I said, today's the day. I said, what do you mean today's the day? I said, you either let me go and start my own business, because I think I can do it, or you let me have all of the production and the marketing team, because I didn't run all that at that time. And somebody else ran it. I said, the guy was just driving me crazy. Said, so it's time for me to actually take that over and let him run the finance piece and the HR and the administration and the general part of that business. And so Jess said, well, when are you ready to be president? I said, today. He said, well, then today is the day. And so that's kind of how I got to where I am today. <laughs> and then really the CEO thing, really it was just a matter of time coming as, as you know, Barbara took over the business and we built a great team. That was a long story to a long question. Rick, when did, you, um, uh, when did you actually have that realization that you had the capacity to run the business in the way that you wanted it to be run? What was it? Was there, was there a particular moment? Was there um, a process that you recognize was the, the fact that you felt that you had a better handle on it compared to your peers in the business? Yeah. I think when I, when I grew up in the sales piece for Jess, and I'll just sit, stay with the, with the KJ world, was that the culture that we had in the sales department, and the, kind of the sales and distribution, because we had you know, 100 people in the sales division and we owned the distributor, which had a couple hundred, was that the culture we had in sales was accountability, professionalism, passion, uh, we had all the tools necessarily from an evaluation standpoint. We had a recruiting program. We had succession planning. We didn't have that in the rest of the company. The, the issue with Jess was Jess managed in silos. And so Jess would tell me to do something one day. He'd tell the next person to do the, kind of the same thing. And ultimately, he was looking for input from different people. But, but I knew that the culture that I had in sales, if I could just take that same culture and put it in marketing and production and the rest of the enterprise, we would have a better company. And I couldn't do it unless I ran those departments. And, and what, I, what I told Jess one day, and actually you could ask me this question, would be, you know, one of the things I'm pretty good at is communicating and teamwork. And what I would say is, when I first became the president, I said the most important team is the senior team. Because we had dysfunction at the top. I was the top sales guy, distribution guy. There was a the top finance guy, top marketing guy. And at the end of the day, when you manage in those silos, our biggest concern was always the money, the budget. And so you fight and backstab each other because you're trying to get the budget for your department and not want that budget to go to other departments. And what I would tell you, when you have dysfunction at the top, you have dysfunction throughout the entire part of your enterprise. Mm -hmm. So in the sales and distribution part, we didn't have dysfunction. We had sort of collaborative and consensus building mindset. We worked together as a team. And when, when somebody didn't block, we covered that block. And you didn't see that in the rest of the organization. I really felt if I could just take that mindset, that culture, and put it in the other departments, we'd be a better organization. Mm -hmm. What I've learned after being the president for five years, and now the, the CEO, whatever that all means, how much of a difference in my day-to-day -day life, is that it's either, the most important team probably is the senior team, but the most important team is the team, mm -hmm. the whole team. Mm -hmm. And so some people say, and I said this before and some things I've done, is that good CEOs fly at 30,000 feet, maybe 10,000 feet. Great CEOs fly at three feet. Mm -hmm. Is that you, and I call now today I call it binary. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you, the answer would be you can't just run a business from the macro level and give big picture direction. So even as the new CEO, yeah, I, I work on that in my big picture, but you really have to get down into the trenches and understand what's happening in all the parts of the company to be a great boss. And I wasn't seeing that in the rest of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. I was seeing these other bosses trying to manage their senior guys mm -hmm. and not necessarily getting to know the people on the on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I knew. It's the, it's the communication in the organization when you know most of the people. I've been there a long time. That's what matters. And I really thought when I became the president, I would look around. There's a two thoughts. I would tell us to our, our employees sometimes. If I were to make you the boss today, right, are, you, are, are your counterparts going to go, hmm, interesting choice? Or are they going to be like cheering you on because they know that was the best choice? 
right? And you, you have that kind of hair on the back of your neck mindset when you get that feeling, you know, should you've gotten promoted, well, of course you think you should, but your counterparts have two thoughts, right? <laughs> Interesting choice. Or, of course, that was the right choice. And I felt that if I became the president at that time, I had the groups behind me from the other departments that would help me run down the, run down to the goal line for a better term. Um, so what have you done to kind of instigate that cultural change materially, either financial processes or, or other processes that have changed as a result of your leadership? I, I would say the, the first thing we did is you know, we, we do company surveys, like many companies, right? So if you look back in 2010, you know, company communication satisfaction was at 39%. And what happens is most employees just want to be in the know. Now they know they're not going to make the decision processes of that, right? They know that they're probably not going to have, we're not going to be, we're, we're a private company. We don't have to give them our earnings or even EBITDA numbers, that kind of stuff. But they just want to know what's going on. And so what we created were, was these kind of town hall meetings and senior management team meetings. We call them the SMT meetings. So I created a senior management team of the top 50 people. And so I communicate every, every quarter to those top 50 people. And I'm like, I'm leading by example because this is called a team meeting. I do it every quarter. And we talk about finance and marketing and sales. Yeah, you're supposed to go do that too. And so I'm leading by example from that perspective to improve communications. I do a thing called three ups and three downs. Right? There's always, Scott works in the company, so I'm still talking to him. <laughs> we didn't have great supervisor uh, employee uh, communication. And you would think, you know, who in this room is a manager of anybody who we manage? And what I tell people is, it's your job to manage. And unfortunately, managers don't want to manage. What they want to do is they want to give direction, but they don't want to give feedback. And so it's easy to tell, 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 tell. So we have a system called tell, show, do, review. You can tell somebody how to do it, but then you got to show them how to do it, because they don't know how to do it, right? And then you kind of review it, right? And then you let them do it, because they've got to learn how to kind of fish on their own a little bit. But my concept would be, if you work for me personally, and I could even talk about this room after I leave, you should be able to tell your employees every time you're with them the three things they do well, and the three things they don't do well. Now, it's not about three and three. It could be two and one, one and two, four and five. It doesn't really matter the number. It's about the dialogue saying, here's the things you're doing well, one minute manager, finding them doing things right. But also, people, people don't like criticism. I call positive conflict, which is, it's OK to have criticism in a very positive way. It's called style, S-T-Y-L-E. And so we now have this process called coaching for performance and three ups and three downs that we didn't have before. And we used to give people ratings like, hey, you're a 3.5. But he thinks you're a 3.25, and sometimes you get caught up, well, I can't, well, I want to make you feel good today, so I'll give you a 3.75. And I think people get caught up with a number. And maybe there's issues with grades. <laughs> and that's not what employees want. Employees don't want a number. What they want is they want feedback. They want to know what is it I need to do to be, become a better valued employee in this organization, and what is it I, do I need to do to get promoted, make more money, and have a better life. And so often I, I do new hire tours. I'm like, do you work for our organization so Barbara Banky gets richer? Because she's already rich. <laughs> You work in this company so you have a good life and you make money and you, have, you go on vacations, you provide for your family. That's why you work here. My job is to provide you a great environment while you're here. So those are some of the things that we're doing. I could just say, are there the processes, you know, evaluations and team meetings and mentorship and training and language training and we do lots and lots and lots of that stuff, but which, we, which we didn't do before. Amazing. Yeah. I just keep talking. <laughs> what are some of the other keys to success? So you've talked about communication. What, what are some of the others? Well, I'll give you just it's, it's, it's things that you take away that are action items. When, so back to the question. So when I ran sales, right, sales and distribution, we had new hire tours. So if you had a new hire, we brought you out no matter where you were from. We had meetings with you. We talked about your, your recruiting process. We took you to the wineries. We trained you about the wine. You met the winemakers. And you understood what this company meant. We didn't do that in IT. We didn't do that in finance. We didn't do that for the people that work for us in Santa Barbara. Today, when you come to work for us, everyone goes to a new hire orientation. You learn. Well, if you work for us in Santa Barbara and you work in the cellar, I mean, you probably think that's not a big deal, but these people don't realize the organization they work for. They get to come up to Santa Rosa, they spend three or four days with us, they get to go see La Crema and Stone Street and all the other wineries, they get to meet other counterparts who they wouldn't have never met before, and now it's about more of a team and a family than a silo. So those little things that bring people together, the collaboration, the consensus building, our shared best practices, whatever you read in school, when you put those into action, they're powerful. It just, it just takes time and investment and maybe a little bit of patience. Do you have anything ongoing or protocol for, I mean, consistently as people continue to work with the company, other departments to integrate the whole thing? I mean, in terms of changes in the company or, you know, Yeah, yep. so, so the one thing we did, okay, I had tons of answers for that, but the first thing we did was, you know, we have a company newsletter comes out. It used to come out every month. It comes out every other month. And it comes out in English and it comes out in Spanish. 
And so it depends on how you get your information. It can be done on the computer or we give you hard copy because not everybody has, has computers. We also do a thing for the, let's say, but let's say you weren't a part of the new hire orientation, but you already worked there for five years or seven years, right? Well, we have a um, cultivation department or class that, that brings people who have been with the company for a while to come into the office and in one or two days, I think it's a two-day thing, somebody from finance comes in and talks about finance. Somebody from IT comes in and talks about IT, marketing, sales, production, winemakers, presidents, vice presidents. And so the people in the middle don't get lost. Okay? So that's a cultivation program we have. We have this thing called high-impact leadership. So we take literally 16 to 20 people that we think are high performers, have high impact in the organization, and we put them into four teams and we give them the opportunity to do a project. And say it's a project that will make a difference in the organization. And sometimes we tell them it's open-ended and sometimes we give them little hints as to what we think we might need. And then they go off as a team and they're all from collaborative departments. They're not all, they're not all production in one team. You cross-pollinate the different departments. And so now I think we've done that five times. And the value is the report that they give us because they'll come back with good ideas and, and they'll come up with another idea that we had from that. But what's more important is the camaraderie is that they now get to know people as you know, maybe a different level in the company, different department. I wish I had a board I could write on. Because when, when people come into the organization, I call it a pathway. You know, you come into the organization, so we'll say you come into the organization, and maybe you're headed to be chief operating officer because you're the, you're the production guy. Life comes at you. You didn't want to be a manager, now you want to be a manager. You weren't married, now you're married. You didn't want to have kids, now you get. Now you're divorced. We, but, but production, that was good. Yeah. But you might have said they're, 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 you got stalled somewhere because somebody was ahead of you to get to that job. Well, maybe you learned another, maybe you learned another skill set by then. And maybe there's an opportunity in the innovation part of our business or the sustainability part of our business that we didn't have five years ago. So you've got to be able to move with the times because in the old days, there might have been five different pathways to go. Now there's lots of different pathways to go. And, and you might have said, well, that one got crowded and I can't get that far as fast as I want to get there, well, maybe there's another path. And that's why it goes back to the three ups and three downs or this coaching for performance is because we can't read your mind. Is that we have, you have to tell us what it is you want to do. You can't just think to yourself, well, my boss knows what I want to do. Your boss doesn't always want to get you promoted, by the way. And so you, <laughs> that's, that's a fact. And sometimes bosses will hold you back. And so I have this thing called the power pole concept, which means I get to know people who work for people who work for me. Because what my job sometimes is to grab those people down from the system and pull them up. Because people will get caught up with a glass ceiling somewhere in their system. And you might say, well, yeah, but I've been here eight years and he's only been here four or she's been here three. Yeah, but she's better than you. <laughs> it isn't about tenure. It's about performance. And so there's all kinds of things that we do to make sure that we know where people are headed in regards to learning other parts of our organization, whether it be collaboration and things kind of thing. I'm sorry to ask a question. I question but how do you ensure that that last part trickles down? Um, in terms of stagnation due to uh, you know managers wanting to maintain the status quo, I think for me it's like me coming here tonight. Just as an example, is that I do town hall meetings. Well, I, I go to monitor, I go to sound hall, right? I talk to the people, I double check with. Sometimes my managers will say, like my, my one of my guy, my new president Hugh Limers, he'll be like, "How come you're talking to Allison? She's like an associate brand manager." I was like, "I'm checking." <laughs> <laughs> I'm checking to see how she's doing and are the things that we're talking to you guys about trickling down inside the system. And what happens in some organizations is that you know, a lot of managers will say, well, I have an open door policy. I let, my, I let my people come to me all the time. There's a difference between saying it and doing it and having a body language that promotes it. And so even the other day, I had my new president, his new secretary assistant, right? And I said, let me just give you an example. I said, you guys need to, to have an open door policy. I said, here's this guy, I'll use the name, it's got to the This guy, Ian, worked for our company. He called me on a Thursday night. He's like the, he's a, he's a photo guy. He wanted to meet with me on Friday morning. I was like, I took that call, and I was there at 8 o'clock in the morning. I told Hugh and his new assistant, I said, you guys wouldn't have done that. You guys would have said, I, you know, he's busy tomorrow. Can you see him next Thursday? I'm like, there's employees that will be a hair on the back of your neck. I'm like, if somebody calls you that you're not expecting to call you, and they're one, they want to see you and you're the president, you probably should take that call. Because if you don't, then you're going to miss out on an opportunity to learn. It's a coaching opportunity, but it's a learning experience. Because you say, well, let me, I'll get back to you next Thursday because I'm busy until then. Well, you lose that opportunity, and you're telling the rest of the employee base that you really don't have open door. Now, if you said to me, my direct report called me at Thursday at 5 o'clock, so I can see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock, I'll tell them to piss off, and they'll see you on Monday because I'm busy. But I know that person. So you're going to feel it as an organization as to when you make sure you open your door 
because it's a coaching opportunity or learning experience that you won't get. And so there's a difference between saying it and doing it, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boom, I love the questions. Keep Kate coming. Kate's a big name in Sonoma County and probably in other counties, and I'm curious about what's your vision for your company's role whether politically, environmentally, philanthropically, in this community and other communities, who do yeah. you want to be? I, my answer is we're leaders. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, it's an interesting question not to be kind of maybe cocky or whatever, is that I think we're there. I mean, when you think about from a sustainability standpoint, you know, we're one of the first wine companies to have all of our properties sustainably certified, and we own 14,000 acres. That would be a lot. We're one of the first companies in Sonoma County to actually pay more for a per ton for, for farmers that have sustainably farm program. We used to have 10% of our growers have it, now half of them have it because we pay an incentive. We're one of the first uh, uh, employers in Sonoma County that when we took a little bit of flack in one day, it was in the paper, that day we made a decision, everybody who works for us went to $15 an hour that day. And that's the great thing about working for a private company was we didn't have to go to a board of you know board of directors. We talked to Barbara. We were, actually, I was up on stage one day, and Barbara was. I said, "Should we just do it right now?" She said, "Let's do it right now." I said, "Great." I stood up in front of the entire company and announced it within 30 second decision. Mm -hmm. And so those are things we're doing politically. I think we're very advanced on those those, those, those situations. We have a great government mm -hmm. team, you know, in regards to getting things done and getting them done in the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's issue, issues today with event and permits and things of that nature. But I would tell you, we don't have any real skin in the game because we have the permits and we have the event center. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're trying to do is make sure that all the little guys have a voice. And we started Family Winemakers of America back in the 90s when there was the Wine Institute, which we're a member of the Wine Institute today because we just joined. We boycotted for 15 years. It's because Jess didn't want to be controlled by the big guys, the gallows, the constellations, and the wine groups of the world. So he helped start Family Winemakers of, of America, which has over 600 members of little guys. Because it's the little guy that has the trouble getting distribution mm -hmm. through the three-tier system into the consumer. So we, we want to give the little person, not the wrong word to say, a voice. You know, now there's, some, there's some winery people in this room today that, that, that are trying to start new businesses. And if it wasn't for the things that we did 15 years ago and leading from a political standpoint and various issues from a sustainability standpoint, it, it helps them get a foothold in the market today. That would, in distribution, I could say, starting a distributor in California 20 years ago, that was leading our industry. So I think we're, do, we're doing lots of stuff, I think. Well, I'll give you props for your um, philanthropic efforts, because I work for Catholic Charities, and I know that you support our organization and a number of others, so thank you. Yeah. I mean, I mean the great thing about you know, the Jackson family is they're very philanthropic, and, it, and it's really what you don't know more than what you know. So when you go to things like the Napa Valley Wine Auction, yeah, Barbara bids $700,000 because she knows she's going to charity. You know, we were just up in Oregon. We were the leading bidder on the things that were there because the money goes to charity. But it's the thing that she gives away, her private money, that nobody really hears about. They're very philanthropic. And, and, but she gives me the wherewithal to do things philanthropic not only for the company, but also on my own. Because I do a lot of my own personal philanthropic activities, too. So. Will you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, oh, here's my story. So I'm on, I'm on the board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, as an example. Right, so my issue is, it would be is that my wife has Parkinson's. And so you'd say, that takes time out of my life to go be a part of that board, but I also do fundraising. So I do a golf tournament every year, which raises about $500,000, you know, but we, we share the money between uh, UCSF, Ronnie Lott's All Stars for Kids, and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. You know, this last year, I did, I'm not sure if you guys are buying, anybody bike riders in this room, bike riders? So this year, I did a thing called Tour de Fox, which was a bike ride around Sonoma County, and the, the great thing about a bike ride, the bike ride's easy to do. The bike ride's cheap. Golf tournament's expensive. Right? <laughs> it is. It is. A lot of people, by the way. Is, um, so I spent lots and lots of my time and energy. That's okay. I did his class last year. I was in Napa. I told him, I said, you know, you did a great job. I'm like, I was sweating like a mad dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot in there. So, what I believe is, great, thank you, is you, you can talk about work life, the JFW Cares program, and some other things. So this year, started in February, the entire company, all 1,500 employees, will take a day off in the month of February, and they're going to give time in the community. So basically, we're giving 1,500 people times eight hours of employment, free time to do things in the community. But you'd be amazed that the community can some part of the community can't even absorb 1,500 people to help because they don't have the system for it. 
And then other than that, we actually have a program where once a year as team members of certain teams, they can take a day off of their work as a team and go do things in the community to give back. And so those are things that we don't necessarily talk about outside the, the boundaries of JFW walls, but it's things that we do that we think are important for our employees. And the reason I love JFW Cares is this, is that if my assistant needed, had a problem, I'd get, I'd get her the money. You want to know why? I know her. And so we've had assistants in the past that had problems with kids, and we gave them the money. You know, I had the ball back a couple years ago, one of our guys had his leg amputated. He was like, he couldn't even afford the medical bill. I knew him. I gave him 20 grand, right? But what about the people who don't know anybody? They don't know who to ask. They don't know how to ask. And so JFW Cares is great because they can apply for that money, you know, kind of anonymously. You know, in a second organization called 10,000 Degrees, they actually administer it, but we fund it. And so part of it is funded by ownership, and part of it is funded by employees. So our employees can, can give away a dollar every paycheck, two dollars, five dollars, two hundred bucks, five hundred, but whatever you want to do, all tax deductible. But you'd be amazed how fast that ends up. And so now you go back and say, people who need a car because they don't have a car, or people whose house that had a problem, but things happen to people. So those are the kind of things that we do that aren't really announced in the community, that I think makes us leaders. I think it's cool too. Like, <laughs> I think that was a cool one. You know, there's some other stuff we do. I just sometimes I forget all the things that we do. So where did you learn to, to think that way? I mean, I'd like to think we try to teach that in, in business schools, but the reputation of business in the community is often not philanthropic or, or self-centered or, or greedy. If this is a very different culture. Uh, was that from Jess? Is it your personal values? I think, I think it's a little bit of both. I think the great thing about it, I'll use, I'll use the family first, because it is, you know, I work for Jackson Family Wines, that Jess gave us lots of autonomy. I mean, some people think, you know, Jess was a hard guy to work for. <coughs> Jess was a hard guy to work for. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you didn't really lie, cheat, or steal, you'd probably be okay with Jess, you mm -hmm. know. But, but Jess actually gave us the autonomy to kind of run our own businesses and our own lives in that way. And Jess was very giving. And so when you watch a guy like Jess, you know, give away, you know, millions of dollars, and he promotes it, you're like, well, this is kind of just the right thing to do. And then you think about just me as an individual and, I, and our executive team, we all feel like kind of the same way. Because, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this, because a lot of you guys are young. Not all of you, some of you are young. <laughs> <laughs> is that you would think, when you first start in the, in the business world, you, this is your job, by the way, this is your mission. Your job is to put more money in your pocket. It's because you need that money to, to take care of your family and your kids and take care of your life. As you move up the rankings in this world, your job later in life isn't the money in your pockets. It's putting money in other people's pockets and then giving them the wherewithal to give back to the community. Because if it was just me giving back, there wouldn't be enough. You need hundreds of people who have good lives and make good careers and make good money to be able to give back. So that's what we think is important. And another thing I think is good for us as an organization was, you know, when, when Jess passed away, we had gone from basically 1,300 employees down to about 1,000 employees during 2006 and 2010. Why is that? Everybody was letting off go, we're letting go of people across the world, right? They just were. And it's only interesting because you was like, if you were the guy that says, well, American Express laid off, you know, 50,000 people today. It's like crazy if you guys go back in time. But from 2010, we had 1,053 employees to today, we have over 1,600 employees. And so on my watch in five years, we have 60% more employees than we had only five years ago. That's a great number because unemployment and job creation is big in America today. And if you just think about Sonoma County and the county where you guys all live today, is that we just have a bigger employee base today, which again pays taxes and pays for the things that we need. That's what's important too. And so it's not just the job that I do, it's the job that everyone that we've created that gives back to the community. It's, it's kind of a pebble in the pond or kind of a trickle down mindset, but it seems to be working. So that answered your question. Yeah. Rick's just on that point, you've got a lot of new employees, basically, you're saying. Almost 50% or, or more of them are new employees in the last five years. Um, one of the challenges we have as educators, we're trying to prepare these graduates to go out and be able to work for you. What are the, um, what are the challenges you're facing in actually getting them to adapt to the model that you have at Jackson Family Wines? What sort of skills do they miss or what sort of um, outlook do, uh, should, they, should we be working on? to make sure that when they get to you, they're ready to work from day one? I think the thing that I would look for would be, once on the job training versus just right out of school, so while, you're, while they're working, there's internships and jobs they, they, they would have. I'm like, so sometimes I think for, for my own perspective would be, you know, if you come to workforce in marketing, maybe you have a marketing degree, but I think having a, a wealth of knowledge is better today. A well-rounded education versus a specialized education is probably something that I, I push towards people. 
is because again, back to that pathway, the pathway you're on will change. The world, I mean, just think about it. The iPhone wasn't around 10 years ago, you guys. I mean, technology, internet, the, the flat world is changing today. And it is about, I would also say, you know, we're all about diversification. You know, that's why I was, even today you're talking about, you know, the global aspect of your guys' curriculum. You know, you need to find a, a way to actually recruit people from all types of places around the country and around the world. Because that's what we're looking for. And what I tell people is, when you come to work for us in general, we're, I'm always like, we're all about innovation and leadership. I'm like, I, I, I'm the leader. I know I'm the boss. But the reason we hired you is because we want you to come with your ideas and your, and your innovation. And what I want people to do, and it's interesting because people take a while to do this, is challenge authority. You know, and, and that's hard for people to do. So I think asking why. Sometimes you might read books like Ask Why Five Times, or whatever you might say. But having people have the confidence to accept criticism and ask the hard questions is what I'm looking for. Sometimes when I interview people, I have two ways to look at it. Maybe I thought you guys are interviewing. Anybody here interviewing for a job? Does that mean I'm looking for people? <laughs> so I was like, if I like you, I think I'm going to hire you. I ask you really hard questions. Try to engage you with hard questions. If I don't like you, and I ask easy questions. I let you walk away feeling good. But that's because you also probably didn't ask challenging enough questions to keep my dialogue going here. And so having people, you know, really be engaged in world affairs. Sometimes I ask the question, I'll, I do speeches at San Diego State because that's where I went. Sometimes I'll ask the question, how many people read the paper today? You'd be amazed how many people don't read the paper today. And I'm like, if you're not staying on head of current times, you, you don't got to read the whole paper, just read the headlines. But I don't, I don't think people are, are, are on top of what I call current affairs enough today. They're, they're, they're caught up on their studies, they're caught up on their curriculum. But if I asked you who won the Warriors game last night, you'd be like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I'm kind of done talking to you then. <laughs> it's always the Warriors these days. <laughs> yeah, but again, sometimes I would tell you, people in business don't always just want to talk about business. They want to talk about current affairs, they want to talk about sports, they want to talk about politics, they want to talk about all kinds of things. So having a, you know, well-rounded well knowledge. I'll give you thing that Jess told me, so I'll come back to that kind of thing. Jess told me to read a book 10 minutes every day. He didn't care what book you read. He, read. He, was a, he, was a, he was a war guy. He, was a, he liked Westerns, too. Because like, you'd be amazed. You'll, your, your vocabulary will increase. Your, your mind will relax a little bit. But people don't take the time even to read as much as they should today. So I'm about how do we step up people's, you know, wealth of knowledge and having a well-rounded, you know, academic career, I guess. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah. it's because it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we'll be. I'll go, but I'll go to one more thought. I'll give me because there's somebody else in the room. When I went to school, I had a you know a marketing degree, I had an economics degree, whatever. Like the one thing I should have done to be the president is finance. Mm -hmm. Probably the thing it took me the longest to pick up. I was in rooms and people were talking about debt to EBITDA and ROIC, and I was like, I don't know what the hell EBITDA meant. Mm -hmm. You know, so learning about finance will keep you out of the C-suite. If you don't really understand finance, and I'm going to say this because there's some women in the room, and there's been some studies on this too. Mostly sometimes, this is hard to say, is that men will mentor men on finance. They will. Men will not mentor women on finance. They'll talk about how to be you know, more vocal and stand up and be more collaborative. But the reality is to get inside that C-suite, finance is the one thing that most people don't have that they need. So that would be my one Achilles heel to tell people, you might be a great marketing person, the guy in the room here. But the problem is they don't always understand the mathematics of things because that's not what they're challenged to do. And having good math skills and finance skills is what will get you to the next level. I guess that would be my one thought. Along those lines, switching gears, what are the other metrics? Obviously, you're looking at daily financials of some sorts. But what other metrics do you use on a regular basis to, to calculate and judge how well uh, well, then, first of all, I'll give you the, the, the soft answer. So, so you know, company survey results. I watch those every year. So for five years, I'm watching to see how people answer certain questions. You know, would you hire, a, would you recommend a friend? That, that's important to me, that, that that metric goes up. You know, I'm looking at, you know, not just our, our, our revenue. I look at that everything. But I'm looking at our distribution. You know, how, we are, how are we distributed across the, the globe in, in perspective? Sometimes I have, I'll give you an example. We own 27 wineries, and we have about 50 brands. We actually have physically 27 wineries, plus we have you know, warehouses and trucking businesses and things of that nature. Is that You can be up 5 or 6 or 10% in our business. I'm up 10%. I'm up. That's either good or bad because you can be down on 20 brands and be up 10%. So we can have an unhealthy portfolio but still make the financial bottom line. Well, I need all 50 brands to be strong. And so I'm always watching the, 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 the matrix of the portfolio that we have. The way we do it is we have four different divisions who monitor the, four, the 50 different brands. Is because if you just gave all 50 brands to one team, 
they would specialize in a certain part of the portfolio that has a more of a driver mindset, and they would miss all the loose balls on the other side. So I'm watching the whole kind of thing, and that's why I'm like, you can do a good, I'll give you a P plus for getting up 10%, but how you get the A is being up on the majority of our brands, because some brands might not have the ROIC you're looking for, but they're in incubator stage. Is that they're, they're, they have a longer term uh, landscape or vision. Yeah, we, we, we'll have a percentage of our business that doesn't meet the criteria. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna invest time and energy. But I got people who work for me all the time that said, hey, we should discontinue them. That doesn't make any money. I'm like, not everything is a financial <laughs> metric. So that hopefully answers your question. It's, it's a multitude of products that we have in our portfolio. I'm gonna go these two right here. These two right here. Yeah, you, you said when um, you started in the wine industry, um, it wasn't because of wine, it was because of business. Um, have your feelings changed about wine and the wine industry since then? Yeah. I tell people, I didn't get into it for a while, but I stayed in it because of the wine. Mm -hmm. You'd say, I like the wine. And uh, because I've been, the reason I like the wine isn't so much that you know, it's a great product. It's because it's intriguing. Is that every year you have a new vintage. And so there's a new store because the 11 vintage was different than the 10 vintage and the 14 vintage is just different than the 13 vintage. So the wine has a soul to no, to no degree. And so it's in, uh, intellectually challenging because I'm not well, that smart of a guy to be. <laughs> Yeah, but it makes for a great story. So I love the fact that you know, every item and every vintage has a different role played in it. So I actually like the, that, that part of it. And then you'd say, it is the people. I mean, we are in kind of a lifestyle business, let's be honest, right? And so the good news, I tell people, we eat great food, we travel to great places, we drink great wine, we meet great people. You know, we're not in the business, the business of selling widgets. You know, as I tell people, you, you get on a plane, you sit next to a guy, in first class, that's probably where I'm sitting. <laughs> and the, you know, she, she was talking as a panel person. We do so many things. Last year we did 12,000 hours of training for our employees, right? So you want to learn about negotiations or how to build your, your, you as a brand. It's amazing how many of our employees take advantage of those classes. And, and some of the other HR people, they asked our, 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 our training lady, they said, well, how do you get people to come? Like, couldn't get people to come to the classes. I'm like, we have all kinds of people. I think people sometimes go to too many classes. <laughs> you know, so we offer so much curriculum because sometimes the value of the employment is more than just your salary and your vacation. It's what we're giving to you in a skill set that you can you can move on from our organization and, and work for somebody else someday. And I have no delusions of grandeur that you know that Scott's going to work for the company for the last 25 years like I did. I, I don't think that that just doesn't typically happen always in, in, in the world today. Is that? But I hope while he's here. He has a great experience. He provides great leadership and great, you know, great productivity. And he leaves with a great feeling of who we were. And I always tell people, we have, we have, we have I think, 11 or 10 master sommeliers who work for the company, more than any other company in the world by the way. I'm like, the fact that they work for us, I think, is pretty cool. But the answer is, when they leave us, they know the truth. So when they go off and they talk, they work for their company, are they going to work to be a sommelier for some big fancy per se or French laundry? They'll have come through our archway, and they'll realize the things that we talk about are true. The vendors we talk about are true, the barrel program we have about is true. We don't really make a bad product. I mean, every once in a while we want to slip through the crack. But not, not, by, not, not on intention, though. So, so, you so but I, I think our goal is to just put so much good quality content up there and then actually have, again, we invest in, we have teachers. I mean, we, last year we did 4,000 language, 4, hours of language classes. We teach Spanish-speaking employees English. Okay? We teach Spanish-speaking employees management in Spanish. You might say, well, why do you do that? Because if they can learn in their home language how to be a better manager and then become a manager and then learn English as a part of that, won't that be a better employee than making them learn English first? I mean, how many people here speak a second language? It's hard. It's hard. And so the, the, you can't force them, but you can't force somebody to learn a second language. You can encourage them and you can give them tools to do that. But if you give them promotional opportunities, that's an incentive to do it. And what I said when we first did it, I'm like, if we don't promote the Hispanics in the system, we'll have done them an injustice by doing all of this language training and doing all of this training. But if we look back in five years and we think, well, not really that many of them have moved up to be foreman and supervisors or vice presidents, I'm always like, that'd be wrong. And sometimes I'll do speeches just like this. I did a trucking thing while we were on a company called Vinlux with the Biagi brother family. And a bunch of people in the room, and I was like, and you can look in the room and say, that's probably not, that group's probably not going to be the next president. And then you look in the room, you know, but I, I don't want to judge a book by its cover. I'm like, anybody in this room want to be the next president? I'm like, can we hire one of those? I mean, can we actively in this department try to hire somebody whose future would be the, to be the boss? Or are you truly just hiring somebody to be a truck driver? Right? It's okay to look for somebody, even in those roles, who have top side potential, regardless of where they start in the organization. 
And that's tough to do sometimes. Back to what I said, sometimes bosses are just hired for the job. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, but can we have one or two? Can, can you have a percentage of people who want your job? And sometimes people don't want that. Mm -hmm. And so how often, so, so to me about being uh, whatever management, it's consistency. I have to say it all the time because new employees come on board or new managers come on board. And if I don't have the consistency in my message, it'll get lost. And so I have this thing like, called, called tigerism, things I say all the time. And because I have to say them all the time, otherwise I, I think people know them. But sometimes they're new employees, they've never heard them before. Your job's easy, man. You got this thing down. I'm ready to get some wine. You got this thing down. I love the questions, John. If you're missing something, you want to jump, jump in too, that's fine. So just, <laughs> no, you got it. Uh, supply chain, a great sourcing strategy. 27 wineries. You guys have grown quite a bit over the past 10 to 15 years. And from an observer standpoint, it looks to me like uh, the ratio of you know, fruit that you own to the ratio of grapes you buy in the open market has shrunk. Um, and I'm curious, is that, I mean, I'm sure that's strategic, cool. but is the goal to bring everything in house eventually? Yeah. Or what's the. So I put you there. That's 100% wrong, by the way. <laughs> 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 it's, it's interesting is that when, when Jess was alive in 2010, we were about 55 45 internal fruit to external fruit. We're 66% today internal fruit versus external fruit. And so in the last four years, we mixed or bought or planted 4,000 acres. 4,000 acres is a lot. No, I, I perhaps I was. That's what it appeared. I mean, you got to control more than you buy. Oh, I thought you said you were the other way around. And my question is, are you hoping to extend that all the way? Or no, 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 because there, there's a monk. First of all, you can't own everything. Mm -hmm. one. Well, it's, it's expensive. Yeah. It's, it, it, there, there is cost prohibitive, prohibitive at some point. But about two-thirds is a good number because we crush about 100,000 tons, give or take. So our 14, 15,000 acres is about 65 or 66,000 tons. But if you get to be too much of your own, right, and then you have a bad vintage where next thing you know, we were down 20 and 30% on some of Verados this year, and you don't have the contracts already in place or the relationships out there, well, then we'll miss it. So we, we know that we have to have long-term contracts. We have three-year you know, evergreens. We have long-term leases and things of that nature because we're looking out three or four years. So what I spent most of my time doing today, I, I'm already looking at 2021 as a mindset. And you'd say, I know our current capacity is 108,000 tons today. And if there's some years you might say, well, in some years if, to make a number, you have to do 115. I'm like, yeah, but what if we get a little bit more the year before the 104 and try to spread it out a little bit more down the road? You might say, yeah, but now you're bringing in too much working capital money and in inventory than you needed to. But it's, it's a balance. And so we have a good sense that two-thirds is a pretty good number. But most of our future acquisitions will probably be at the estate level and up. Because Kendall Jackson has a portfolio more than likely will only grow maybe 1% or 2% a year, like 3.5 million cases. We don't need to grow it that much. Our growth plan is to grow the estate part of our portfolio, the Cambrys, the La Cremas, the Free Market Abbeys, at somewhere between 15 and 20%. And then the top brands, the high-end brands, which are like the average FOB is 500, they sell for 100 bucks a bottle. We've been growing those in 40s and 50s. Our plan is still to grow those in the 20s and 30s. And that land comes expensive. <laughs> And so when you're talking about things like Verite, 450 bucks a bottle, you know, we're trying to control that land too. So it just, it's, it's a balance act. And it is about, you know, it's, it's about the number of tons you can crush and how many facilities you have. The answer is, you might say, well, we don't, we don't, Arrowwood we own. We don't use it as a winery today because we don't need it. You know, Fremark Abbey is a winery we own. We don't use it as a winery today because we don't need to use it as a capacity. So we also have extra capacity in our system that's unused today if we needed it. But to use those wineries in our system, they'd be inefficient. Well that, well, that makes you, you're not boutique. Yeah, but where it's made, it's, make, it's actually made in Stone Street, which is still a relatively small winery in the big picture, versus our competition, which is Gallows and Constellations. They still make them in very large, you know, industry-looking wineries. You guys can justify sitting on a production space, just in case you need it? Yeah, right? well, here's, here's a thought. If you had a 10 million case winery, and you wanted to get rid of it, who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> Limited number of buyers. So our philosophy has always been, one, I'll give you just in Sonoma County, we own a winery called Stone Street, right, it's in Alexander Valley. When less than five miles away is a winery called Ben, which, which makes KJ. Less than maybe eight miles away is the Verite winery, very, very close. Hartford's not that far away, the Crimin's not that far away. And so you think in that area, we could have just made Vinwood bigger. But it's not about that. It's about having a boutique mentality, et cetera. And, so, and you want the grapes to come from the, from the vine to the winery as fast as possible. And so, we don't want to have a commodity mindset, and we have lots of different winemakers who have different opinions, and we let them kind of make the wine on their own. There's a, there's a judge and jury which is called ownership, 
And there's a finance team, which you just can't let it make all the decisions. You know? But you but you taste if you taste all of our wines, they taste very unique. And that's our goal. Now you could say every once in a while it's just one taste similar. But sometimes in my own marketing team will say, well, you can't make Carmel Road like that because it tastes like La Crema. I'm like, do you not think Mandavi and Meridian and Jay Lord are trying to make La Crema? <laughs> I'm like, it's okay for a couple of ours, we make hundreds, to be a little similar because we make so many. As a visionary in wine industry, it seems like, I mean, that was really Jess's. It's insane. And that's what you would say. Jess would say, it's easy, they're easier to build and buy, and they're also easier to divest or dis disassemble. And so to have one large winery like a Gallo would have, or even the Asti winery, which is up here in you know, Cloverdale, you know how difficult that was to sell for those people? Because there's limited numbers of buyers that can buy that large of a facility. Yeah. Right? So you see, so that's not who we are. And so that's not how we built the organization. So. So, so I'm curious, you mentioned Verite, 450 bucks a bottle, and it's located near Stone Street and a few others. And I've always been fascinated. I'm not in the wine industry, but I'm a consumer of wine. I've always found it interesting and fascinating, and just the price point differences. And I'm just kind of curious, you got you know, Verite at 450, two buck check, I, everything in between. What's your philosophy or methodology in terms of price points for all the various? Get as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you, you look at the high-end, the collector brands like Verite, the answer would be that's a, that's a collector world. You can say, and I've always believed this, is that the difference between a $5 bottle of wine and a $15 bottle of wine is like that. Th there's a big difference in my opinion. Between Barefoot and KJ or, you know, uh, Cupcake and this brand, I think a big difference. The difference between a $400 bottle of wine and a $2,000 bottle of wine, so, so, so Verite to Petrus is probably that much. You're talking about scarcity, you're talking about you know, credentials, you're talking about heritage. So the answer is a lot of this has to do with marketing, not so much about margin. So you'd say, well, why does Harlan get 750 and Petrus get 200 and Verite gets 450? If we had a blind tasting test right now, it'd be close. And you'd say, well, is that one that much better? You want to spend four times as much for that as you would this one? So it's about what the market will bear to some degree. I guess that's some answer to your question. It's what the market will bear. So what's the best? value then for everyone in the room we're gonna go buy a Carol Jackson wine that doesn't have very good margin because it's not on marketing call and cost. <laughs> I'll give you that I'll give you that. First of all, the best thing you should go buy is Kendall Jackson VR Chardonnay because it's been the number one selling Chardonnay for twenty five years and will be the number one in ten years because the only way you could catch up to VR Chardonnay, you need a time machine. You'd have to go back in time and buy the vineyards and get the resources and have the barrel programs that we have to make that wine. It would almost be impossible. And sometimes it doesn't get the respect that it deserves because it's so popular. Mm -hmm. It's almost like people don't go there anymore because it's so crowded. You know, the answer is very, very good. Now, if I said the other thing, I would say probably one of our best values at the high end is a brand called Mount Brave. What is it? So Mount Brave. Mount Brave sells for seventy-five, eighty-five dollars, and basically it's almost—it's kind of like it's—it's it's made from Mount Beaver property where Cardinals farm too. So Chris takes the best fruit for Cardinal, which is why it's two hundred fifty dollars a bottle plus the acreage. Three hundred thousand dollars an acre, and he picks it at one ton an acre, and you know, brand new French barrels every year, etc. So Mount Brave has a high, has a high, has a low price for its cost value. So if you guys got eighty-five bucks a bottle laying around, that'd be the one I go get. <laughs> um, back to the uh, development and leadership. Um, I was thinking about what you were saying and, and and all the approaches that you have for developing talent within your organizations, um, and thinking just personally about my team. Um, is there something that you could do as a leader to help cultivate the desire and the drive? You know, I've got great guys that do their job admirably, but I don't see any of them having that drive to go make that, you know, next step that I want to be is great. And I, I like the three up, three down thing. That, that sounds awesome. Um, but is there one thing or a, just a, a very small handful of things you could do to sort of encourage um, performance. Perform well. I don't know if it's performance. It's more more like um, desire to uh, to to grow outside your shell. It's only fun. I give you a quick little story, right? So I just tell my kids, what's more important than family and friends? What's the most important thing? Desire. I just tell my kid, my son has a tattoo on his back. Desire. True story. <laughs> and so desire is hard to get. And so sometimes it's within you. And so the only thing I tell people is that. The one thing as a manager you should do to drive people for better for performance or have a better desire is give a shit. Care. Care. And so sometimes people feel that you care. Is that you're actually looking out for them, right? You're, you're asking them good questions, you're helping them out. That's why I go to the tell, show, do, review thing. Yeah, sometimes you can tell them, hey, hey, make a better outlook. 
You drop your rob book sucks. Make a better rob book. Your rob book sucks. You say, let me just show you how to do it. Here's how to do it. <laughs> let me just take your rob book, make it into a very good rob book, and say, look, this is what it should look like. And then in two months, I'm going to check on your rob book to make sure it still looks the same. You took the time to not just tell them what to do, but you actually showed them how to do it. And some, ma some managers think, well, that's not my job. I don't understand that concept, but I'm the manager of these people. No, you need to have some experience <laughs> in the job that they're doing. Because otherwise you're just become you're you're your unneeded supervisors. You need to actually help them. And so the caring part I would say. And it, and it is that thing is that I, I'm always like, get to know, them. that's what I that's what I'm always like. But if, if you find that they're underperformers and they lack desire, and I wish I had a little chart here is that yeah, yeah you gotta you gotta get rid of them. At some point you're doing them a dis disservice by letting them be be mediocre performers. Because mediocre performers I mean, here's a question. Do you think A players want to hang out with C players or work on the same team as C players? No, no. because they're probably thinking, well, hell, I'm getting paid about the same amount of money as that guy. I'm working on Bob. <coughs> so this person is bringing down our team, right? Sometimes I, I say, I think there's two guys in the huddle, right? Two good football analogy, right? There's two guys in the huddle. It's, four, it's fourth and goal, right? So if you don't get the touchdown, you've got to get the ball back. So there's one guy in the huddle who says, do not give me the ball because I do not want to be the goat. If I fumble, I will be an embarrassment. That's not the guy you want on your team. The guy you want on your team, or the person you want on your team, I should say, is the person who says, of course you're going to give me the ball. I may not make it, I'm going to die trying. And so the question always is, which one are you, and which one of those people do you want to work for you? And so if you don't have that sort of spirit on the person who works for you, well, at some point you've got to come to the realization that I may not be able to, you know, you give a chance, you know, there's always evaluation time, evaluation time. But if you have the question, how long do you think a bad hire stays in a company? Um, 12 months? Too long. 24 months? <laughs> long. I think the act, I think it's like over 20 months because you evaluate him, you give him a, a performance program, next thing you know, you get promoted, now he works for you, <laughs> you think you're going to make him better, next thing you know, you're worried, they, they, they linger. And in some organizations, I call them imposters. Is that sometimes they're, they're salespeople or they're marketing people. They were never designed to be salespeople or marketing people, but they got into that, that part of the company because that's just where they, they were. And, but they don't realize till later in life, they're not really, that's not their passion, they're not really that good at it. And so you've got to find people that are called not really pure, but you've got to weed out the imposters as your organization because somehow they got to work for you. Now whether you hired them or not, sometimes well, you didn't hire them, but you're looking out for them. But I'll get a question, so I told you a lot. How many people do you think, if this was a new hire tour, I would say, how many people in this room think we have C players? Everyone thinks, well, we've got C players. Do you think we only hire A players? And you would say, yes, because we all just got hired. <laughs> we just hired you, so do you think we only hire eight players? The answer would be yes, but the answer is every year, and you might even say, oh, you we have 1,500 employees. So if you said 5% of the population are C players, it's probably more, but let's just say 5%. percent that would be 75 people. So it means every year we should meet out 75 people of the organization, right, and find 75 new employees. But if you had a graph, you'd say, well, that moves up the bar. And if you do that the next year, the bar moves up again and again. So if you used to be a B player, and the bar got risen a couple different times, and you haven't improved, well now you're the C player. And so you just got to have that hard conversation with those employees so they know where they're at. And so that's what I, I have a heart to heart to say. If there's somebody who's not performing, you got to tell them. And what I tell people sometimes, I mean, I use a bad example, would be, if I fired you for being a bad typer, you're, you're not a very good typer, Brian, I'll let you go. You'd say, well, if you'd have told me five months ago I wasn't a very good typer, I would have become a better typer because now i got to go and tell my wife and kids I got fired. You should have told them already. And so I'm a big believer in telling people the truth all the time. Blunt honesty. I'll give you another example. It's the holidays. It's the holidays. And let's say we're going to fire somebody. Bad word. People don't really get fired. You say, would you fire them today or would you wait till January 1st? Let them get through the holidays. A lot of people would say, let them get through the holidays. It's inhumane to fire them for the holidays. Here's the reality. That person's got a situation. He buys a present. He buys a car. He does something he would not have done during a holiday time frame, if he knew he wasn't going to have the income in January. So did you do the right thing by waiting? Or did you do the hard thing by doing it when you should have done it, so the person saved the money he would have spent otherwise? And see, so a lot of people would say, I know, but that just sounds mean. <laughs> right? It is mean. But it's probably the right thing to do, and that's when you'll know you're doing the right job, I think. It'll be, you'll, you'll feel it in your heart. Mm. Answer your question, that thing? Give me some ideas. Well, it's, like, so it's hard to say how do you create desire in somebody who's well, not motivated to do something like hey, pay more. Maybe maybe I wasn't real clear. Five more dollars an hour if you do that job. I have, I have some technical guys that work for me, and they're very 
uh, highly qualified to do their job and actually they do their job exceedingly well, but they don't have the drive to move out, uh, up in the organization. And I think there's a place for high performing people that want to do that job and do that job as best that can be done. That's what I would say. Here's what I tell people. Let's say you're in what position? Are you, you, what are job you have in our company? Let's say you don't want to get promoted. People are okay with that. Well, then just be the best one of those you can be. And that's okay. Because the, the answer is not everyone's going to get promoted. You only, you only have so much positive turnover in a company. And somebody says, I really don't want to work till 6 o'clock. I don't really have the desire like you do, Brian, to actually work that much harder to get promoted. That's not on my agenda. I have a good life. And that's okay. You know, I'm a big promoter of people that, you know, want to have life balance. And so I'm always like, they, they're, they're not as motivated as you. And that's okay. But just make sure they're really good at what they do. And, and, that, and that's going to be okay. But they're going to have to know the ramifications of that. They can't come back to you in 12 or 24 months and say, hey, well, you know, Paul got it promoted over here. Yeah, but we had this conversation already. And so it's managing the expectations of the people that work for you with hard, honest dialogue. And I call it positive conflict. You don't got to be an asshole to have conflict and hard conversations. It's how you do it. But you can't, if we all agree today on one message, well, they got the wrong people in the room, right? We need people to disagree in different opinions. People come from different backgrounds, and you need to encourage that. And you would think I've been with the company 25 years, and I would discourage change. This is the way we do it here. So I built this company. This is how we do it here. I'm probably the furthest from that. I'm always encouraging, challenging authority. And so giving people, the, giving people a voice and an opportunity to critique you, too. You know, I love the company survey, and when we first started doing the survey, people thought, oh my God, I'm not going to write my name down, or if I write who I am, they'll know who I am, they're going to come get me. I'm like, that's a conspiracy. <laughs> and my own assistant, she was like, oh my God, they're going to track down who I am. I'm like, I'm almost the boss, why are you worried? I said, I'll be so proud someday when people fill out the survey and put their name on it. And so I think Brian's, I think Brian's a bad manager, my name's Vicky. I'm like, how good is that? <laughs> because now I can understand Vicky's perspective and try to help Brian get to a better place, right? Sometimes people come to me and they'll say, you know, we got problems out there. Have, people in the sales department are, are doing something wrong. Well, who is that? Well, I can't tell you because it's supposed to be confidential. <laughs> well, then get the hell out of my office <laughs> because I can't help you. Or I can't fix the situation unless we have a hard, honest conversation. And it's not about protecting and not having confidentiality. It's about, if you've got a problem, then address it with them. Don't come to me and say, Bill's a problem. Why don't you go tell him he's a problem? Well, I'm conflict. I've had people who work for me, this guy, Jeff Wilson, he's our chief legal guy. He used to say, well, people in our company, they don't do this, this, and this. I went to the executive meeting, I'm like, who? Like, marketing? You mean Steve? Because he's sitting right there. <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, Steve. I'm like, well, just say it to Steve. Don't say it to me. And what's happened over, it took a long time. It takes time for people to actually come out and call people on the mat but it's how you do it, right? You've got to have a positive atmosphere. Yeah. So. so all along your uh, professional career, um, you have implemented a lot of uh, changes and um, you know, innovations and whatnot, but sometimes you have also faced failure. So how have you dealt with it? And how you keep your team motiv motivated yeah. when you... Yeah. I'm, I'm a humor guy. I'm a humor kind of sarcasm guy. So I think <laughs> I deal with it. I tell people I make mistakes all the time. You know, one of the biggest mistakes, people say, what was one of the mistakes you made is that when I first took over as president, I asked Jess, what is it you want me to do? You know, what's my kind of mission? Jess was like, pay down the debt. I was like, okay, pay down the debt. Got it. So I created this thing called GREAT, like growth, revenue, assets, production. You know, you learn that management school. You have some m, &M or synonym and you create this thing. And, and I, remember, I did a bunch of meetings. I'm like, our goal here is to pay down the debt. We're going to do growth. And I think it scared the hell out of people. We have debt. <laughs> like, we're like, no, we don't have too much debt. We manage the debt, but it scared people. I was like, I gave the wrong message. And so this is the way the story goes. I went back to all my team. I'm like, well, what is the vision of the company? And people say, well, to be family owned or make great wine or do this and do that. So I asked Jess one day, I'm like, hey, Jess, what is it you really want us to do other than pay down the debt? It scared people. He goes, I just want to be the best damn wine company in the world. And I was like, that's good enough for me. You're the boss. So our new vision of our company is to be the best damn wine company in the world. <laughs> and the reason I like that is because it's not like a 40-yard dash where I win and you lose. It's hard to describe the best, right? And so what it does is it gives us the thought process, and we have initiatives called lands, brands, people, and innovation. So we have all these strategic activities that we're doing to make us the best. And so not being the best says we must do these things to become better. So it creates passion and ideas in the company to make us better. So I took a negative, right? And I kind of make fun of myself because I, I did that. I actually went around and gave like eight of them. 
<laughs> like, Holy crap, that was bad, right? <laughs> Scared people. <laughs> but you took that and I said, I just turned around and said, I gotta change that and turn it into a positive. But when we do things wrong, I'm always like, you gotta laugh at yourself a little bit. You gotta look in the mirror and say, we're just people. We're, you know, people get out of bed trying to do a good job all, all day. I, I don't believe in a conspiracy theory that someone's coming into work today to screw me out of a dollar. Right? Like you're trying not to work an extra hour. I don't think that. I think people come to work every day and they're trying to provide a value. Sometimes they just don't know how. Sometimes they just don't know how. Or they don't have the same ambition and desires that you have. And that's okay too. But if that doesn't fit on your team, for example, you just gotta find a new person. And sometimes people get miscast. You know, that doesn't mean they're bad employees. They're just in the wrong department. So maybe in your company there's another place for that person where their job skills can actually be better suited. So just a matter of getting people to the right locations at the right times. Because sometimes what happens in companies, you promote somebody, they're a great employee, they get promoted. Now they're the boss, but then they suck. So you fire them. Yeah, but you fired them from a job they didn't do well. Why didn't you just put them back into the job they did well? So just reposition them and recast people into a position that they can be more productive at and have a good, good self-worth and self-esteem. So I'm not sure the time level. Yeah, well, we're just about out of time. One last question. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about what the opportunities are in, in the future. So you've got a group of people here who might be looking for opportunities yeah, yeah, in the wine yeah. industry or in the area. What do you see? What does the future hold? I think the future is bright. I, the thing I have is another trigger Our future is greater than our past. I say that all the time. I'm like, almost like when you buy a stock. Let's say you buy a stock, PepsiCo or whatever. Been around for hundreds of years, but you don't buy the stock because you think it had a better past. You buy the stock and a better future. And I'm a big believer. I don't care if you're 45, 55, or 65. You have to believe there's better days ahead, just in, in the perspective. But I think the opportunities in the wine business are one, this whole social media concept. So. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever that's going to be, that ain't going away. Now, it may not be Facebook in 20 years from now, but it is going to be some sort of internet-based digital communication platform. 25 years ago, you put an ad on TV, it was pretty simple, everyone got the message. Then it was kind of magazines. Now there are hundreds and thousands of ways people get information, and you can spend lots of money in the wrong place. So understanding where to put the X, you know, and how to invest your money in that digital world and more digital communication skill set, I think, is important. So that, that's that. I definitely think that you know people talk about you know the, the, the global marketplace. You know the answer is the wine business is big. You know, not just in America. I mean the, the wine business is big in France and Italy and Spain and Australia and Chile and you know, all the world. The world of wine is continuing to grow. So if you have a skill set in wine or production, those kind of things, you can almost work anywhere in the world. Um, people have the thought process that you know American wine is going to be sold around the world. That's not true. And so there's a concept, oh my God, China, China's going to be great. China, I've been going to China now for the last six years. We don't hardly sell any more wine today than we did five years ago. People in Brazil don't drink any American wine. People in Germany drink very little American wine. People in Russia don't drink any American wine. People in Spain don't drink any American wine. People in India don't drink any American wine. It's hard. So those are opportunities in the future, but I would not rush to that immediately because those, it's just hard because of the taxation and duties and tariffs and the, 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 the kind of prevention. But... You know, one thing about even working for an import company or companies that import to America, imports are coming to America at a rapid rate. I mean, if anything, it used to be 10%, then it was 25, now it's a third of the business is import. So working in the import wine business is good because America, if you, if you make wine in Italy or Spain, where are you selling your wine? In America. We're the most profitable wine business in the world. The last thing I would say, and I should have said it first, because we, we, we've now created a sustainability team. Used to be one person, now there's two, now we're working on three. Water is going to continue to be an issue from now until forever. And understanding there's a cost to water, and I can show you some photos, but is that there's a cost to water. So understanding water conservation from a, from a winery standpoint, whether it's tanks and cleaning tanks, we're using ultraviolet lights and things of that nature today, that is not going to go away. And understanding the water use is bigger, that ain't going to go away either. And so whether it used to be just irrigation ditches, then it was drip, now with smart irrigation, now we're managing sap flow inside vineyards or vines and things of that nature. So having things to do with sustainability, whether it be water or solar energy, or like even today we use Tesla, Tesla batteries to store energy from our solar, uh, solar panels on top of the, the, I think the nine wineries we have, something like that. We're the largest solar using wine company in the world. But that's important. And it's, and it's evaluating those tools. So it's not just the applications of it, it's the understanding of it, and then the working with PG&Es and fishing game and the water boards and things of that nature. So it's not just the, the actual sustainability part, it's also the regulatory part, which I would tell you cost a lot of money. So it's a pain in our ass. It ain't going away anytime soon, by the way. But understand, having that position in government, which understands regulatory issues would be a big, 
would be an opportunity for a position somewhere in the future. That ain't going to go away. So, one last question. One last question. All right. Uh, labor. Uh, that's sort of a broad subject, but no, I love it. What do you see happening? I mean, especially in the vineyards, it's becoming a more challenging issue um, every month. It seems like, and mechanization is only advancing. You know at such a rapid pace. So what's the answer there? I mean, it's hard to do the answer. So in 2010, one of our plans was to improve mechanization in the vineyards. So, so when we plant new vineyards, where possible, we're planting them to be mechanically harvested. Five years ago, I would tell you winemakers, they were afraid of these machines because in the old days, they would turn them almost into soup, a little bit. These, these new plants, when they come off the end of a vineyard, they're actually de stem They come out like literally like caviar. And then you're running through these optical sorting machines. I mean, they're basically eating pure fruit. So mechanization is not going to go away, and part of that is labor. Okay. So in places like Monterey, where we're actually, you know, challenging for labor against blueberries and and uh, and uh, other vegetables, you know, row crop products in there, it's tough, right? So even recently, we hired farm labor contractors to bring in labor for our for our places. This year, believe that we've had people, farm labor contractors, come to our vineyards, they look around, and they walk away. They don't want to do that. Today. Maybe it wasn't enough harvest. It was. It was too difficult of a slope. Like, we can't have that, you guys. And so, whether you have a good H two A program, which is going down to Mexico, bringing people in, it's a lot of regulatory issues. We're going to continue to use that as a resource. So I'm a huge advocate. I even talked to my team today. Like, how do I help now that I'm not as busy as I was before with this immigration issue? And whether it's a guest worker program or a blue card or something of that nature, we need it. And you might say, well, they're still in American jobs, and I'm telling you, they're not. And that's just and the, the answer today. We're not going to deport 11 million people. It ain't going to happen either. No. And so yeah, right. we need to get past this. I'm not a Republican. They're trying to be crazy. You know all the issues over over immigration. Right. I'm always like, I'm not really afraid of Jose. I'm afraid of the, the Taliban. Uh, but I, I don't think we should be so concerned about them. We yeah, you have to protect your borders and those kinds of things. But we need a program to get people to work here. So what we're working on is creating our own FLC, doing our own H2A programs because we can't have that problem. Our concept would be maybe we have our own H2A, we go down to Mexico, we hire the people, we train them in Mexico in the off season and bring them up as skilled labor. Because when you bring them in, you have to pay them the same wages and benefits that you have your existing employees. And we're okay with it. We just need the workers. So that would be uh, temporary seasonal employees as opposed to hiring FLCs. Well, we use FLCs currently now. Sure. We've had some FLCs that have literally walked away. Yeah. And I'm, that pisses me off. And I'm like, well, how do we create our own FLC? We can do it ourselves. And so we so there's H two A programs and that's kind of a guest worker program. There's FLCs and then there's your own employees. But the answer is we bring in interns to for the for the harvest. So we're bringing in people that need to work for interns and you know kind of a temporary seasonal jobs. So we 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 use a combination of all those things, but it's only going to get harder as as more and more vineyards come on and more and more you know activities happen throughout the you know the Monterey areas and the Central Valley. So it's, labor's going to be a challenge. And again. How do you have, how do people have a living wage is important too. And that's why I was so proud when we came out with the $15 an hour thing. In minutes, people that made $12 an hour, you know, they went from, they got a 25% raise. Like, holy crap. That was top to bottom. I mean, all your field workers. Everybody. One day. Everybody. Yeah, the only thing we haven't quite figured out sometimes, we have some temporary employees like maybe, but even the dishwasher, dishwasher guy, dishwasher guy was making 10 bucks an hour. We had like four. One day they got a 50% raise. They were like, sweet. You know? <laughs> they were doing it. Good to have a good dishwasher. And the last thing you think, can you imagine you here? You guys all, you know, can you imagine living in Sonoma County at $10 an hour? Nope. No. Can you imagine living in Sonoma County at $15 an hour? No. Right? Those people aren't going on vacations. They're not going on, they don't live a lavish lifestyle. This is a tough place to live. And so you have to provide good work experience. But beyond that, for us, it's, it is the education and training. So beyond the $15 an hour, it is the language training. These people benefit from it. It's the, it's the management training. It's the other benefits we give them and bonuses and things of that nature. It's more than just the $15 an hour. And so it has to be a comprehensive compensation program, yeah. not just that one yeah, element. That doesn't fix the whole thing. This, sorry, so you want a job? You need a job. Come work with No. No. <laughs> Get some afterwards. We're, 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 we're running out of time. So uh, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing your leadership lessons.